Thank you. So we've previously been hearing uh, from uh, logistics, we've been hearing from neuroscience, and we've been hearing from politics. Now I'm going to be the crazy guy from the philosophy department, talking about the meaning of life. All right, this was the human condition. We had this nice idea that the human condition was something that was given either by God or nature. It was unchanging and, well, we had to do the best we could with uh, this situation. But then we started to realize that, hmm, we actually have a past. We have evolved like other animals. We were different in the past. And actually, we're going to be different in the future, most likely, because other species do change. And uh, that changes. Well, some of that is going to be up to us. So the human condition is no longer a given. It might actually be a political decision or a lifestyle decision these days. It is a political decision, for example, in many countries there are laws against reproductive cloning. And this is really a, a, a law about defining humanity, saying, okay, humans don't reproduce asexually. Of course, in a few decades' time, maybe some new political parties come in and change those laws, and uh, maybe now it's all right for humans to reproduce asexually. We have similar debates, for example, uh, uh, about reproductory rights. Uh, uh, should people who are transsexuals, who have got an apparently male body, still be allowed to uh, uh, have children? There are some people saying, no, we can't have a third sex. And most likely they think that, well, that would change the human condition too much in an, uh, from an important way. Others of us would say, hey, that's fine. As long as we're nice parents, they should be having as many kids they want. So the interesting thing is, we are in a situation where we actually have options to change what we are. Of course, not all of this is using very advanced technology. This is a drug bust from Stockholm uh, about two centuries ago. And as you can see, the little old ladies are drinking this devious, dangerous, expensive foreign drug called coffee. Yeah, it was mostly tax reason why the King Gustav III didn't like it. But basically, this is a cognitive enhancer. It makes you a bit more alert. It helps you on vigilance tasks. It uh, ma makes you think that you're a little bit more uh, intelligent. We have other cognitive enhancer drugs that, that actually have a bit more effective uh, forms. Um, the interesting thing here is that we are actually getting a rather big library of ways of improving our condition. It might range, of course, from so somewhat unsafe forms of doping over to interesting experimental cognition enhancers, over to various forms of memory training, which really extend us. We can change our bodies cosmetically, or to some extent uh, using uh, uh, our functions, both changing genders, but also adding prosthetics. We're actually getting better at modifying, uh, uh, both reading and modifying our genes in order to do new things. So uh, we might be able, for example, to put new genes into brain cells to make them light sensitive. This is called optogenetics, which might actually be a better way of communicating with the brain rather than plugging in electrodes and sending electric signals because it turns out that this way we can avoid the strong electric fields. Of course, it also means that now we change the genome. And we might, of course, consider, hmm, maybe our kids, uh, should, what genes do we actually want them to have? Again, many people say, that's a horrible idea. You shouldn't be changing the genes of your kids. But it's an, uh, uh, something we can debate as a kind of political and ethical matter. It's not just something that exists. It's an option. So. What should we actually be doing? What kind of enhancements or changes to the human condition should we be going for? Well, one approach is, of course, to ask people about it. So this is from what I think is one of the best papers about the ethics of uh, enhancement ever done. And it's published in a marketing journal. It was apparently published there for ethical reasons, because it was much easier to get ethics approval and, uh, for doing a marketing study than an ethics study. They asked students, um, uh, w would you like to have a pill, if it existed, that enhanced various mental abilities like uh, memory and the mood? And they asked some other students, how fundamental are these traits to your sense of self? Would you be a very different person if, for example, your mood changed? And as you can see, people in general think that stuff that's not that fundamental, the kind of cool things like memory and attention and alertness, Ah, that's pretty okay to enhance. After all, who doesn't want to have a pill to perk you up so you can listen to boring lectures? On the other hand, people get rather nervous about stuff that they perceive as fundamental to themselves. After all, uh, it might be a weird kind of kindness I show if I know it's coming from a pill. 
Still, as a philosopher in Oxford shouted when he saw that, they're wrong. We should be kind, even if it's from a pill. <laughs> and that, of course, raises another interesting question. Maybe philosophers know something uh, other people haven't. Or at least we can have an interesting dialogue between the philosophers and the normal people. Of course, typically that dialogue tends to be rather messy. You ask a philosopher for the meaning of life, and either he makes a joke of it, or he asks you a counter question, mostly what you mean by meaning, life, and question, <laughs> or gives you a lecture. You got the lecture version. Uh, typically, answers to the meaning of life or what kind of life should we live have kind of five basic answers. The first one is we should strive to achieve the highest good. What that good is depends on which philosopher you ask. The second uh, thing is well-being. Life should feel good. It might be something as simple as uh, simple pleasure, or it might be some very elaborate sense of meaningfulness of um, the work you do. Uh, the third uh, possibility is, of course, to avoid suffering. It might be the Buddhist view, or it might simply be pure pain. We have a lot of different kinds of suffering we might want to avoid. Then there is the fourth thing. Well, there is not that much uh, meaning. We just live here. And then there is the fifth one, some weird combination of all of the above. After all, in order to make a good career in philosophy, you need to come up with a new answer that kind of contradicts sufficiently many famous philosophers so you can write your paper and be controversial about it. <laughs> this goes for a lot of other disciplines too, but in philosophy it's so obvious. So what happens if we try to apply that to humanity? Well, obviously, striving for the highest good. We all think we're doing that, and we all disagree about what that highest good is. So, the enhancement that might help me achieve, let's say, knowledge, which I think is a really good thing, that might be very different from what you think is uh, the highest good. If you think, for example, spiritual contemplation is good. Having a lot of coffee in your system when, me when meditating might not be a good idea. Hmm. Then we have uh, that thing about well-being. There I think most of us are more on the same page. Yeah, uh, we roughly think we know what well-being is, at least until philosophers start talking about it. But it's still a rather complicated thing. And then there is an interesting thing about th those guys who just happen to live here. Survival. Regardless of what you think is the most important good, uh, and whether you think well-being is just about uh, eating grapes or uh, climbing mountains, you need to be alive in order to do it. You don't want to die before you've done whatever you think is good in life. So survival might be very important, not just for us individuals, but as a species. As a species, we've been remarkably successful, which is both good news and bad news. On one hand, we, we're unlikely to die out from any of the things that kill most species. Most species that have existed on Earth have died out, 99% of them. And, and then, of course, there is the little problem that many of the problems for a uh, Stone Age population don't apply to us. However, we created our own problems some of which ones are much better at wiping us out than any kind of starvation you would get in your Stone Age cave. This is a bit of a problem, and it gets worse, because all these wonderful exponential advancing technologies allow us to wipe ourselves out in all sorts of interesting uh, ways. Yes, nanomachines might uh, create a world of abundance, but we also make it very easy to manufacture stuff we don't want, like weapons. Biotechnology, mm, wonderful thing for neuroscience and curing cancer and, well, biohacking, maybe drug-producing bacteria. Whoops, they got out. It's not that hard to put in the genes to make cocaine uh, in an uh, E. coli bacterium, and then you could uh, kind of culture in your kitchen. But of course, if it gets out, you get uh, a drug diarrhea, which might be a very bad thing. Of course, people die happy from it, but still, not a good idea. And artificial intelligence, while I'm very much in favor of it, the problem is if we get the motivations right, we might get artificial superintelligence that doesn't like us, or even worse, doesn't have a clue what we like about the universe and changes it to what it likes. And unfortunately, that might be paper clips, or it might be in, uh, cats, or it might be something completely random. So we need to fix this. Existential threats, threats to the survival of species, are actually much more important than most people think. Because if we die out, it's not just 7 billion people, the value of, vo of those lives that go then away. We might actually lose the value of all future generations. And they can be very, very, very many. If we think about how many planets there are in the universe, how many stars, how much future history is, and you do even a rough calculation on how many future human lives are in principle possible, you realize that we're talking about billions of billions and billions 
of possible human lives that are at stake. If we mess up in our international security politics, we might actually wipe them out. Including, of course, all the value we already acquire, all the art and the hard work, as well as all the good things we might do in the future. Depending on your theory of value, different uh, entries on this list have different values, but they're very important. So we might want to actually do modifications of ourselves that reduce these risks. Some of them might be simpler than others. Uh, pandemics, for example, if we can boost our immune systems like using vaccinations and do technology that helps us survive them much better. Hmm, if we could actually transfer us, uh, ourselves into computers, we would be completely safe, at least from the biological uh, viruses. Computer viruses would suddenly become a problem, but if people actually uh, are both biological and artificial, at least one half would be doing fine. Uh, nuclear weapons, uh, well, we could try improving our radiation tolerance, but that's kind of not a good solution. It would seem that we need a more clever way of cooperating with each other. We might even actually fi fix climate change by modifying ourselves. After all, it might be possible to make us allergic to meat, so we don't uh, use that much for agriculture. Uh, let's halve our length, we're going to need just an eighth as much uh, food, and maybe make us smarter which tends to mean that you have fewer kids because you figure out there are other interesting things to do rather than sex. <laughs> I'm not entirely serious about this suggestion of having smart green dwarfs as a solution uh, to climate, but we should consider it as a kind of upstream solution. Modifying ourselves can actually have quite a bit of an effect, and some of that might actually help us improve our values. One change that I think a lot of people would actually think is good and not just in the sense good for the world, but good for me. Mm, yeah, I want it. It's, of course, life extension. There are plenty of reasons you might want to extend life. For example, it's very unhealthy to be old. A surprising amount of diseases are actually diseases due to the aging processes in the body. So even if you just say, oh, I don't care about living forever, I just don't want to become infirm. Actually, slowing aging is a very serious proposition to improve it. It also saves a lot of money medically. And of course, it saves a lot of human capital from disappearing, and a lot of wisdom from disappearing, as well, of course, as individuals we care about. Most importantly, it seems that, well, if you live longer, you tend to care more about the future. If you know you're going to die tomorrow, well, tomorrow uh, can uh, wait, you don't care about it. If you know you're going to have to put up with the consequences of your actions uh, in 50 years' time, hmm, you better behave yourself. Another area where I think we all would agree it's probably that it's better to be smarter. There are a lot of studies showing that, yes, in that intelligence, crudely measured with IQ, but you can use other measures too, actually have a lot of good effects. Not just the obvious ones that you do really well on Sudoku, but also things that you cooperate better. You get more of a long-term perspective. You're actually willing to wait for rewards. Um, it turns out to be really good for the economy. Mainly, of course, because people learn a lot of things and then they get high-paying jobs but we also cooperate and network. It might actually turn out, according to some American economists, that it's more important for the economy as a whole than for the individual. If I get slightly smarter, I don't notice it. But if everybody gets slightly smarter, we all get much richer and perhaps more green. So thinking about the future and the world, it seems like, well, we haven't gotten here because we planned on uh, having this current world. A lot of it is just happenstance. I think a lot of it haven't turned out very badly but we can do better. And it seems pretty obvious that both for our own sake and for the sake of the world, living longer and becoming smarter are actually things we both want and philosophers would say are really amazingly important. We might apply some of these ideas of, from bioethics also to ourselves and think about, well, how should we be doing it? For example, uh, well, everybody has an autonomy. We should be allowed to modify our bodies as long as we don't harm anybody. Yeah, that seems sensible. We also want that uh, to have an element of trial and error. Why? Because we need a lot of diversity. We don't know the best solutions yet. We need a lot of different approaches, and most of them are going to fail and be rather embarrassing uh, 10 years later, but we're going to learn from that. And we need uh, a lot of this interesting diversity. If we think about beetles, they've been extremely successful simply because there is a beetle for every possible purpose you could imagine. A lot of them mi mildly bizarre, of course, and when something happens, there is always at least some beetles that can manage that. I think we should be thinking the same way. We also should consider that, yeah, 
when uh, they're thinking about modifying our kids, for example, or future generations, yes, we have a responsibility. We don't exist yet as persons. We don't have any rights in that sense, but we care about them. We want them to have a good life. And that requires us to you know, give them general purpose goods, things that you know, they probably would want because they're good for everybody. Good health, long life, intelligence, ability to cooperate with each other, but also an open future, freedom to change themselves, to make their life into whatever they want, including, of course, into some weird form of beetle. So I think the future is going to be very interesting. I think we have a very big future. Most people don't recognize just how awesomely big the future is. There is so much space out there, so much time, and so many possible human lives and ways of living in a human life. We shouldn't risk that. And that's why we should be in, uh, trying to create this in the future, using the little tools we have now and recognizing that, yeah, we can build it, atom by atom, gene by gene, bit by bit, and idea by idea. I think we're going to see not just one humanity plus, but actually a lot of humanities plus. Thank you. <laughs>